they're, they're truly predictive on how well you're staying up with the material um, that we're going to need to be assessed on with the test. So can't always be ready every day, so it's not a big deal, um, you know, but if you're consistently not being prepared for these, then that's an issue, that's a problem. Okay. Um, so what is the exact composition of bone? We know that it is one third organic and two thirds inorganic. Define technique is a sustained muscle contraction, which is not normal, right? That it's sustained. What's the function of calcitonin? Calcitonin lowers blood calcium levels. Uh, it does it by initiating osteoblast activity, but as long as you said, decreases blood calcium levels because. This is where we were talking about keeping blood calcium levels in homeostasis because hyper and hypocalcemia is not consistent with life, is it? It's not consistent with life. So a mechanism to stay in blood calcium homeostasis is our skeletal system. So calcitonin lowers blood calcium levels and it is released from the thyroid gland. Will this all be on the next test? Yeah. Every bit of it. Every bit of it. So it, no big deal if you didn't get it now, but if you don't get it on the test, then um, that's an issue. Okay. So what's the function of calcium trial? It's to raise blood calcium levels, and it's from release from the kidneys. Um, what's the most common bone disease? Osteoporosis. Define ectopic ossification. It means that you're laying down bone where bone shouldn't be. Okay, that can mean the lungs, muscles, brain, eyes, arteries, a problem, right? Define lordosis and exaggerated lumbar curvature. Lateral deviation of the spine is known as scoliosis. Describe the following. Sinus, you wrote cavity. Foreman, you wrote hole. Process, projection. Fossa, a depression. Fair enough? Okay. What's the name of the area of long bones where lengthening occurs, the epiphysis or the epiphyseal plates? So, you know, if you notice on here, you don't have to write a lot, do you? You know, so it's not like paragraphs being asked for. Okay. What exactly is achondroplastic dwarfism? It is, a, it is a dominant trait that is going to um, close off the long bones early. So long bones won't lengthen, but irregular bones will continue to grow. Okay. Fair questions? Are these fair questions? Yes. All right. Um, so just as a, you know, some just reminders about some things that are coming. Uh, I do have some people out today, so you know, just this to remind you too, I keep getting these questions, even though I feel like you talked about them, certainly you talked about them with the syllabus as your contract for the class. You can take lab quizzes if you miss them, you actually must, because if you don't take them, and you should take them by the time the next time the class meets, lab quizzes and tests, because if you don't, you get zeros put in for those, and those are really hard to overcome. So, but do you make up lecture quizzes? No, because I'm going to drop several lecture quizzes. I get that you're not going to always be prepared for these lecture quizzes. Things come up. But um, so quite a few are going to be dropped, right? Um, but you, so you, you cannot make those up. But you can make up labs and tests, and you should. So um, just as a reminder about what's coming up, and this is important that you guys know, so in a week from today, we'll have the bones lab, and there is no word bank, and spelling counts. And if you're out that day, I'm going to need a hospital a notice about it that day. And I, I seriously kind of need that, because I'm going to need it. Because it's, it's really inconvenient to the entire class when people are, are doing it. So that lab quiz will be one week from today, the disarticulated skeleton. Uh, today in lab where you all are spending time with those bones again. And, uh, some of you the other day stayed really late and, and were looking at all the bones. Um, you have today and you'll have the next time we meet and then it's one week from today. That is a practical, so it means that you are going to have all the bones. 
laid out for you and you will be going through labeling them no word bank the way that I do that and I'll do it again today in the lab and practice I'll sort of show you this again just to make sure everybody's on the right page with this is I will have the, bon the bones labeled with numbers I'll use two different colors so everybody listen up to this and I'll tell you when I give you the thing that you'll write on for your practical um, I'll tell you that one of the colors, if you see one of the colors, it means I want the name of that bone, name the bone. So one color will mean that. So for example, if I use blue for those, anytime you see a blue number, you know you need to name the bone. Like the os a pelvic bone is the name of that bone, the hip bone, right? So you write os if it were blue. And then I'll have another color that I will tell you that it means I want the group of bones or that region on that bone. So for example, like the oscoxe, that's the name of that bone. There's a right oscoxe and a left oscoxe. And then on the oscoxe, in parentheses on your, your handout, you'll see that I want, there's some regions I want you to know about, right? There's the ileal region, the ischium, the pubis, and the acetabulum. So those are regions of the oscoxe. So if I had blue, it means for that number, name the bone. But then if you see a different color, like maybe I use yellow or green or whatever, if you see the other color, then it means that wherever that label is on that bone, I want you to tell me that region. Fair enough? Maybe it would, that other color would be on uh, a group of bones. So for example, like the vertebra, this is a human skeleton, but uh, and she might be good to be in here. But anyway, I would because things come to this particular. But if I, I told you all on your list, you've got two vertebrae, I want you to know their names, the atlas and the axis. So that would have been the blue color, because I want their names. But if I had like the other color, like maybe the other color where it's yellow, and it's here, it means I want this group. And this group is called what? Cervical vertebra. So this is the cervical vertebra. Or if I had it right here, you'd say this is the thoracic, that yellow color would mean this is the thoracic vertebral group. Or if I had it here, you'd say lumbar vertebra, right? Now these are vertebrae too, but they're fused, aren't they? These are the sacral. Vertebra. So this won't be with these, these, but this will be separate, all right? And so I would probably just have that blue color here and you'd say what? Sacral, sacrum, or sacral region, right? Anyway, fair enough. I'll we'll have two colors of numbers. One color will equal to what? Name the bone. The other color will be named the region on that bone. Or name, and I'll have it right on the region I want you to name. Or name the group. So, for example, um, I didn't have you, each of these little carpal bones each have a name. But I, and you're, on your list, you'll see, I just want you to know that these are the what? Carpals. And these are the metacarpals. So, I would have that, you know, that color that correlates with region or group. Fair enough. That's one week from today. If people are not studying a little bit each day for that, um, that's going to be a lab you can throw to you. You know that. Well, you can. I don't drop any labs, do I? Do not drop any labs. But I will tell you that um, either today or Thursday, I'm going to be giving you your list of muscles. And if you haven't learned the bone, <coughs> the muscles are really going to be hard. So do you have any questions for me? about what's coming. I know this is a lot. I get that it's a lot. Um, so time management is the biggest thing for you to be encouraged to uh, get a hold of and for this. All right? Because we're going to be finishing this up and then considering all things. Right? Um, so any questions for me about what's coming your way? So lecture, the quiz will be Thursday. We'll have a lecture quiz on what we do today. Okay, so be prepared for that. Um, do y'all have y'all don't have any questions for me?
Do I feel okay? All right. Okay. Um, I think we were just about finished up with the anatomy chapter because we, you know, we saw where chapter 18 was almost all anatomy. It's just labeling, isn't it? So we were labeling sinus cavities. There was a little bit, there was actually a little bit of physiology. We talked about sinusitis, the inflammation of the sinus cavity. The most common cause? The next most common cause? The very rarest cause? Right. And when we take antibiotics and we don't really need them, they suppress the immune system in more ways than one. So um, it's important to, to realize that, that, um, you know, whatever. Now, there are a couple bones on your list, like the hyoid bone that I have on your list, that you actually have a little hyoid bone that you can see. But there are a couple bones called the, um, the auditory ossicles, auditory mean hearing, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And I actually have a couple of, I have a little model of them. Um, but I don't have any actual bones for you to feel of those, but I need you to know their names now. So I will want you to know their names and how to spell them, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Uh, another physiology thing we talked about were fontanelles. What are fontanelles? Fontanelles are the spaces with what people call soft spots, and it's the spaces between the skull bones of an infant and child, and as their, their brain is developing, those spaces close off. We also talked about the physiology of the vertebra, the vertebral column and the curvatures. And so we know some disorders that are associated with that. I'm just trying to make sure I didn't forget anything. The atlas and the axis are the names of C1 and C2. The atlas, the atlas is C1. It's holding the world. <laughs> it really is holding the world. If y'all look at this atlas here, you'll see these fossa that sitting in that are going to be the condyles of the occipital bone. And this is allowing for you to make this movement here. So this atlas truly is holding your what? You know in mythology, what did atlas hold up in mythology? The world, right? And is, is this bone holding up your world, your head? It really is. Now the axis is the C2, is the one beneath it. And the axis has this little process Oh, we know a process is a projection, don't we? It almost looks like a tooth, doesn't it? So guess what it's called? A dontoid process. It's also called the dens. So I don't care if you call it the dens or the odontoid process, but it almost does look like a little tooth, doesn't it? Now, do you think bones have processes willy-nilly for no reason, or do you think they serve a function? They serve a function. So the way that this, this process, the function that it serves, this little thing is sticking up like a tooth, is so that you can make this movement. It, and you can make this movement like this because of that process. There is a joint there that's allowing for that. So another reason I want you to know the dens or that process is called the dens on the axis. It's also known as C2, cervical vertebra two, right? Um, that process, the reason I want you to know it is because we know that actually what's moving through this foramen, this opening here, is what? Structure. The spinal cord. And you've got the spinal cord moving through there. This is when you all hear about whiplash or when you've heard that somebody's had a broken neck and they died instantly. It was because that process, it's a wonderful thing that we can move and we can protect ourselves. You can look, you can see what's going on. Um, but if that process breaks, what's it going to shove into? It's an instant death. So I do want you to know about the endontoid process, also called the dens, and that it's a process on the second cervical vertebra that we know we call the axis, because what is spinning on that? Your head can spin on that panel. Okay. All right, so those are those vertebra. Then we also know the thoracic vertebra, how important they're, still, they're protecting the spinal cord, but they also give them structure for this thoracic region where we have the visceral organs, the lungs, the heart, the glands that are associated with all those vital structures, right? Um, so we have those thoracic vertebra. No two vertebra look exactly alike. 
if you take a higher level anatomy and physiology course, you have to be able to recognize each one of the vertebrae that were sitting separate. So you'd have to be able to pick one up and say, oh, this is T8 versus T4 versus, you know, whatever. Because they all actually look a little different. They have a lot of things in common, though. That's why you can probably, when you see a vertebra, even out in the woods from an animal, you can tell it's a vertebra, right? Because they, they have a certain look, certain things in common. The, thumb, the lumbar, excuse me, lumbar vertebra are the thickest body ones, but that's because they have to withstand the highest amount of pressure. So that, that makes good sense too, doesn't it? And then the sacrum, we said this is the sacral vertebra fuse. They usually fuse by late 20s. They're usually already fused by then. You can tell that woman uh, was, it must have been older than that because her, her sacrum is fused, isn't it? Um, and this, again, is how sometimes when they find even parts of bones, not even a whole skeleton, they can date and give an age to the skeleton because of how much of this process has happened, um, the fusion of some of these bones. The coccyx is going to be these four little bones that usually fuse by the early 30s. So these are also typically uh, fused by then. When somebody says they broke their tailbone, this is what they mean, they broke their tailbone. A lot of us have broken our tailbones, you know, because so oftentimes when we fall, where do we fall? On our behinds. And so, um, you know, and so it's not so uncommon. You can break your tailbone during delivery, too. Um, that's a very common thing to happen. And it's, it's really not a big deal. I mean, it might hurt a little bit, but it's not a big deal, and it'll heal itself. There's not much they can do, you can do about it. Um, the thoracic cage, when we think about this thoracic cage, you can see how protective this would be for the thoracic organs. And if you um, think about this cage, we've got all these ribs. You know, we talk about there being 206 bones. Many of them are ribs and vertebrae, aren't they? <laughs> Look at that. Uh, so many of them are that. So we, are, we have the right ones and we have the left ones, and there's a whole bunch of them. But I did, would want you to know that you do hear about things called true and false ribs. Um, the false ribs really aren't false ribs. They are ribs, but they call them that because the true ribs have a direct connection to the sternum cartilage connection, a cartilage connection. So if you look at these first ones, you can see that direct cartilage connection. See, this is cartilage here, right? Um, the only rib that I think doesn't really look like a rib, and you, because I'm telling you all that, you can maybe take a look at it today, is the first pair. The first pair of ribs are very different looking than the rest of the ribs. And so do you think on the disarticulated skeleton, I'm going to put out one of the first pair for y'all at this level? Huh? Did you say yes? I, I'm really not going to do that. But this, um, I mean, it looks like a rib, but it's, it's just different. This first pair is kind of different looking. Um, by the way, your lungs, your lungs, the apex of your lungs actually come above this. So this clavicle is protected, the ribs come above this. People don't realize you can get hit in the neck and collapse along. Because the apex of your lungs are pretty high, actually. Up in here. Up in here. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So we have, come on, sorry. Sorry. Not even doing any drugs. Look, so you guys. We also, in this thoracic cavity, just so you guys remember, maybe from the regions, it, and maybe you didn't even see this, there is a dome-shaped muscle here at this lower end, at this inferior end of the thoracic uh, cage, and it's called the diaphragm. And that dome-shaped muscle, when it contracts, it pulls lungs with it. And that dome-shaped muscle is completely separating, uh, compartmentalizing the thoracic area from the abdominal area. So and just in just picturing that like that will that will make me right so uh, you all can picture how they these are incredibly protective. The false ribs have an indirect uh, connection. The false ribs have an indirect connection and you can kind of see that here. They're the as far as pairs go, you know, I, I just want you to know they have an indirect cartilage connection. And then we have, you know, also in that these um, floating ribs so you can see maybe on the, these examples so i would just have out a rib 
And I think everybody's going to get that one, right? You know how to spell it. And I'm going to have out one of these common looking ribs. Um, the pectoral girdle, this uh, pectoral girdle is going to be including the clavicle, which is the collarbone, the scapula, and the, um, the cl clavicle both. So this is going to be considered this area. And the clavicle, the sternal end is flatter where it, where it abuts up to the sternum uh, than the part, the acromial, which is at the shoulder. And you guys remember the regions, don't you? What did acromial mean? Shoulder. Isn't it? So when you look at the regions of the clavicle, it should make sense to you why it looks the way it does, because one of the ends butt up against the sternum, and the other one um, is more rounded and smooth where that shoulder is. So anyway, just give yourself some hints while you're looking at these bones, okay? The upper limbs, again, this is just anatomy, isn't it? Humerus the radius and the ulna. I'll tell you the way that um, I had a student tell me this years ago and I've just never forgotten it. I thought it was a great way to remember the ulna and I'd never had anybody ever say this before and I thought, yeah, that's a great way. The, the ulna at the proximal end, proximal meaning closest to where it attaches, has a U shape. U for what? Ulna. So y'all look at that today. Look at that bone. It's the only one that has that nice U shape. So when y'all are looking at the bones, look for things like that. The radius, the radius has a little round end that is, it's just beautiful little round, little round end, proximal end. So that's another way to help you know the radius. Um, the carpal bones are the wrist bones. The metacarpals are the palm and the phalanges are the fingers, right? Now, on your list, you might have proximal, medial, and distal phalanges, but, but you know, you're just gonna have to call them phalanges. It's a group, they're a group of bones, right? You do have a name for the thumb, and that'll be on your list, it's the colix. And this pelvic girdle is composed of the oscoxae, the right one, the left oscoxae, and the sacrum. This region of the oscoxae is the ileal region. This depression is called the ileal fossa. This crest is called the iliac crest. Go figure. It's protecting some intestines, especially small intestines, that are called the ileum. Do you get what I mean? Learn these things as you learn these bones, and will it help you later on for everything? It really will. Guess what this joint is called? The iliosacral joint, because this is the ileal region of the oscoxae, and that's the sacrum. So joints, it even helps you with joints, doesn't it? So um, anyway, you all call this your pubic region, right? Guess what those bones, that projection of those bones are? the pubic region of the oscoxae. So, you know, some things aren't so hard. Okay. Um, there is a cup-like depression on the, on a lateral aspect of the oscoxae. When you look at it from the side, you'll see this cup-like depression that the head of the femur sits in. That cup-like depression of the oscoxae is the acetabulum, say it. Acetabulum, and it's spelled exactly, really, like it sounds. At well, it's acetabulum, so it really does. Should y'all be talking out loud when you're studying, and should you be breaking down the words and saying them distinctly out loud? And it will really <coughs> help you with the spelling of these. So, um, great. Comparisons of male and female pelvic girdles, they, they look different, don't they? But certainly they look different for, for a big reason, and that's because females might have um, might be in need of having that fetus pass through. So the angles on these openings are going to be different. The thickness of this ileal region is different. You can see that this is flatter, thinner, more spread out, isn't it? Um, so there's there's quite a few differences in measurement comparisons of a male pad pelvis and a female pelvis. Again, it's why they can find a piece a piece of a pelvis and know if it was male or female. If they have a, an entire pelvis, they can often even tell if it if it were female 
if the female had even ever delivered. So, you know, there's ways that they can tell this. So there's all kinds of measurements that they can take. The femur, I have people miss the femur, but I don't really know why or how, because again, no other bone has a head like this, you know, and it's also huge, right? So, um, so I don't know, but today when y'all are studying and Thursday when y'all are studying, truly do, you know, as you're saying the bones and looking at them, be thinking about even some regions on them that are unique to them. All right? Do I have any questions? Are we good? Okay. Um, the patella is what people call the kneecap. And that's in your, you know, that's in your bones. You'll see that. And then again, nothing else looks like a patella. But then you've got the tibia, which people call the shin bone. That is that largest bone in the lower leg, the tibia. Um, I will have students write, and they'll, well, I do have students write thigh bone and shin bone. I do have that. But, but I will have students um, write tibula and fibula. That is not correct, right? It's tibia and fibula. So the tibia is the large, and that's why you need to be saying them out loud over and over again so you don't make that mistake. So the tibia and the fibula. The fibula is another one that I have students often miss, but again, I'm not sure why, because it is really long. <laughs> you know, it, it like wouldn't be go kind of anywhere else. It's a really long bone. It's, it's a strut, it's a lateral strut um, in that lower leg. And, you know, so I don't know, but sometimes people get that one confused too. Pay attention to, to some aspects of the bones and that won't happen to you. And also just pay attention to, um, pay attention well, just the aspects of the bone, but how they're pronounced and whatever. And again, it will help you with spelling them. I was thinking of something else, but I don't know what. So you can see this is like all kind of anatomy. Now on the foot, on the foot, um, when we think about the foot, you all learn that the region of the heel, that region is called more accurately the calcaneal region. Those of you who got that on that lab too, it seems like a long time ago now, doesn't it? But anyway, those of you who, who learn that, that the heel is called the calcaneal region, you'll be a step up because guess what? This part of the tarsal bones, which are these irregular shaped bones, all of these are tarsal bones. This heel is called a calcaneus. Calcaneus. The talus is the one that's just superior to it that, are, that joins or articulates with the tibia. So this is the talus, this is the calcaneus, and this group that those two belong to are actually called the tarsal bones. You will see sometimes tarsus, and again, this is just Latin versus, um, you know, whatever, but tarsal or tarsus, right? These are the foot bones. The ones that are in the arch, we think these are metatarsals, and then these toes are what? phalanges. The halix is the big toe, the big toe, and it certainly are phalanges too, but a name I had you all know is the halix. So um, I will often have students that, and by the way, your, the foot that you will have will be articulated. The hand that you have will be articulated. So I don't think it's fair. You don't have enough time for me to separate all those little bones and, and for you to name them. So you'll know that if you see a certain color that I told you is region or group right here, what would you say? Metacarpals. If you saw that on the arch, you would say metatarsals, right? I have a lot of students who don't pay attention and they'll call like, they'll call their metatarsals phalanges. Pay attention to what are the fingers and toes and what are the arches and palms, okay? Pay attention to that. Because those are easy. I, I sort of feel like those are gimmicks, you know. Any questions for me? No. Nope. Um, the foot arches, this is physiology. This is the last thing for physiology for bones. We should have a nice arch in our foot. Is there anybody that's flat-footed in here? It's a hereditary thing with the flat-footed. What keeps the nice arch are ligaments. And what do we say ligaments are? They're connective tissues that hold bone to bone, that stabilize bone to bone, right? 
So you have these arches, these uh, excuse me, these tendons that so that support the arch and give you this nice arch. And again, I'm going to take physics physicist's word for it. If you have a nice arch, then when you are walking, when you are walking, it's dispersing the energy and weight so that it's not such a, such a burden on the spine because we are bipedal. And you know, it's really interesting. How many of you have done any uh, research on, on being bipedal and how humans should be walking? Have you, has anybody seen that? Or running, do I have any runners in here? Runners, okay, not many people run, okay. Uh, so, um, I know, I'd have to have something chasing me these days too. So, but, but seriously though, we have our, our shoes, modern shoes have, have, are ruining our backs and are doing a lot to mess up the musculature of our legs and our backs and back aches, headaches that come from this. But if you are flat footed, if you are flat footed, that energy you can see, and it's called pes planus is what flat feet is, uh, it, that's what it's called. So you all would want to know that term. It's right here, it's pes planus, pes planus. So that's flat feet. So if you're flat footed, it actually is putting more of a burden on the, on the spine and the back and the legs and whatnot. And some people have chronic headaches and they find out that it's because they're flat footed. And if they have flat feet, and if they can start doing some PT stuff, it can actually help that. So um, same thing with like back ache and legs aching. So just depending. But it, what's really interesting, and I, I want to do more research about it because I've just recently in the last few years been, been hearing and seeing this. Um, if you look at hieroglyphics, and if you look at some of the earliest art that humans have, the way they depict people walking and running is actually on their toes, is on the balls of their feet. And because of our shoes and because of our whatever that we wear now, we really are doing more heel toe. How, how many of y'all have ever heard that you should, when you run, you should run heel toe? But actually, that's really not much. Because when we look at, uh, there's some cultures and some tribes where people run, like they run for joy. They, that sounds like they're running. But no, they really do. Like they run, like at their parties where we're, we're drinking, they're running. They run. They, they have games where they're running. They, they run. Um, and so there's, I think it's in Central South, it's Central America. There's this tribal, and they live um, in pretty high altitudes. But it's an average thing for them to run, you know, like almost 100 miles a day. A day. Okay, and here, wait, I'm not finished. They're barefoot. Okay, so I mean, how crazy is this? But when people want, it's not crazy. It's really we were meant to run because guess what? We had to get food, right? And we we had to be pretty fast. And sometimes we had to run our. Um, we had, we were eating. It's it's from our fossil evidence. We know we were eating meat way before we had the tools like spears and stuff. That would have gotten the meat. So guess how we got it? We outran it. Now, does that just make? Is that just awesome? Like I get too much talking about that. I think that's amazing. We need to kind of go back to some of our roots, don't we? But I think that's really amazing, and it's it's showing more and more. Now that doesn't mean we were as fast as what we were eating, but what we were, we had the endurance. They had short fast feeds, but as long as we could cut out, we could keep running we could wear them out. And you know how we know we could do it? Because we still have people who can do that, who can run that many miles a day. And they just keep running. And most animals will have to be faster, but they can't last as long, right? I just think that's fascinating. So also the idea about what, where we put pressure on our, when we walk, when we walk. Um, so anyway, it's just a whole science. Whatever, I'm over. So, but anyway, we, we're supposed to have these arches. And so, if we don't have these arches, it really can cause problems. And so, um, they used to not accept people into the military in our country if they were flat footed uh, because they knew people who were flat footed had all kinds of issues. And they also had certain things they couldn't do. You know, um, but they can't, can't do that duck walk. How I many of you remember being little and doing duck walks all the time? 
did that for fun back in the day. So anyway, <laughs> it would be ugly if I tried to do a duck walk right now. <laughs> so, but they, you know, they couldn't do that. So there, and there were other things that, that they couldn't do. Now I think they accept people into the military. I know they do with flat feet because they do, um, you know, some they can do prosthetics if they have to in the shoes. They can put things in the shoes. Any questions for me? Guys, guess what? Congratulations, you have finished the lecture for Bones, and so we're going to take a quick break and we're going to start joints. Um, this next section that you'll have a multiple choice test on will be bones, joints, and muscles. So don't get behind. If you didn't do well on your Bones lecture today, not a big deal, but please, by God, get it, okay? Because we're about to do joints. And then we're going to go right into muscles, and then we'll have a test on those units, right? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. That won't be, that will probably be, um, let's see, today soon we'll finish joints. It, I don't think it would be until that next, that next Tuesday. You get what I'm saying? But that in that same week will be the muscles lab. So for muscles, yeah, I know, it's rolling, isn't it? So stay up. Stay out. Time management, please. If you're thinking, I, listen, and I have people who are very close to me, and, and I was the same, that I could do things at the last minute. You can't do that for this, this profession, and you can't do this for this topic. You've got to be studying some every day. Yes. What is it? the last week of class, is it? Um, I don't know. No, I, it, it, it really might be because we'll have already started the nervous system. The nervous system has several chapters, but there are a couple of them that are just redundant. Um, but anyway, I've, I've got to look at the dates. Do y'all want me to look at the dates during this break so that I can come back in and try to give you real tentative dates? That would be lovely. Yeah. Yes. That would be lovely. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. This class finishes on uh, March the 2nd or something. And that's no, but, well, it's the 1st because that's a Thursday. March the 1st. Okay, I'm going to do that. Y'all go take a 10-minute break, and I'll be back at that time. <laughs> All right. So, so guys, um, here's your calendar. You ready? Everybody's ready to write this down so that they know it's coming, and I think this is a great idea to do this. We really are going to – we really are on schedule for this. I don't know it might seem like it's crazy, but anyway – so you don't have to write today's date down, but if you had wanted to, today we are going to be um, starting joints, but that chapter goes kind of fast, so we'll be finishing that today. Maybe even, um, probably not, but maybe even start on muscles and finish muscles Thursday. So we're finishing muscles Thursday. Um, you guys are going to be taking a, on Thursday of this week, you're going to be taking a, you know, the lecture quiz on everything we covered today, which will be joints in some of muscles, maybe. And then we'll finish muscles Thursday. On the 19th, on the 19th, we're actually starting lecture on the nervous system. We'll be starting lecture on the nervous system. That's what lecture is going to be. During lab time, you will have the bones on the 19th, you will have the bones practical, but we will also be looking at brains on that day in lab because we'll have started the nervous system, right? So we will be looking at brains that day, just in lab, looking at them. On the 21st, which is, will be a week after we finish muscles, you, it would have been a week after we finished muscles. You On the 21st, you will have a multiple choice test on bones, joints, and muscles. On the 21st. Multiple choice test on bones, joints, and muscles. Good? 21st. On the 21st, obviously, we will continue our topic of the nervous system. Right? That's our lecture time. There's three hours of lecture that we have. And then on the 26th, we'll finish our lecture on the nervous system. And during lab that day, you will have a muscles lab quiz. By the way, your muscles lab quiz, you do get a word bank. 
And I actually give you the word bank. I'm going to give you the word bank this Thursday. You're going to be able to start looking at those muscles. You're going to see that many of them you would know just because you know the what? The bones. Right? So on the 26th, we finish our nervous system lectures. We do a muscle lab practical, and we dissect eyes. That's on the 26th. The 28th is our last day of class. And I have to get the grades in by that next day. So people who are missing any of these that we're talking about, uh, it's going to be over by the 28th, last chance. But on the 28th, see, we have that entire day, but I can't be finished. I finished up lecture two days before. But on the 28th, it's really just a testing day. So on the 28th, you will have your nervous system multiple choice test. We will have a break because we had all really four or five hours that day. So we're going to have a break. You will also have a lab labeling of brain structures that I will have given you the structures and the eye and the ear. Structures on the eye and the ear. So these are labs, just like the skin that you labeled. I will, did I give you the structures for the skin? Did I have to give those to y'all? I'm going to give y'all structures for the brain, for the eye, and for the ear. And you will have lab quizzes on the 28th, because the 28th, the only thing we're doing is testing. We will go have gone over that nervous system test together. And if there was a question that you missed on the nervous system test that was a clinical insight or a deeper, or a deeper insight or a disorder, you'll know the answer, because we go over them, just like we go over every test, don't we? And we will, at the end of that time, you then have the exam. It's on the deeper insights and the disorders. So we'll have two tests that day. So we'll have our nervous system test. test. We'll go test. over it. Then lab test. Then we'll have lab quizzes. quizzes. And, then and then we'll, we'll take a break. A we'll have a break. Test. And you have a 50 question multiple choice test on disorders and deeper insights. This, by the way, is no different for an eight week scheduled test. Then my other, I've had a couple people who've been in my other class. That last day, you have both the last test and a break, and then the last, the final exam. That's always the case in my classes. Have you all known what the final exam was going to be on from the get-go? What's the final exam? Deeper insights, and the deeper insights and the disorders. The disorders tables didn't start until chapter six, but the deeper insights and disorders. So you've been keep you've been reviewing those for this, and so that final exam is only on those. So you want me to do it again? No, I want to come back to the second part. The second part starts after the break, spring break, March. Oh. So, so guys, what, on the nineteenth you have a bone. I'm just going to do what the quizzing testing is. I'm not going to say what we're lecturing on. On the 19th, you have a bones practical lab. On the 21st, you have a bones joint muscle test. On the 26th, you have a muscles lab practical. On the 28th, you have your final testing in here, which is the nervous system test, the final exam, and some labs. That whole day is just devoted to that. We do have to take the nervous system test together that morning at nine o'clock. So we'll go over it together too. But after that, I, and this is what I always do too, I let you all, you can leave and take breaks and come back in here and take your quizzes as you're ready for them, including the final exam. So you can go to the library, study a while, come back and take one of those labs, then go study a little bit more, come back and take another one, a later one, you know. And when you're ready, come in and take your final exam. You have all morning, all day, really, until like one o'clock that day. Get those done. Yes. So it was just the lab, it was on the 26th and the lecture. On the 26th, no, we had lectures every one of those. They don't like a lecture. Uh, no, we always delayed the lecture. 
places, right? So I, I wasn't telling you all about the, the lectures or stuff, but I did the first time I went around, right? So you all need to be staying up. If you're not staying up with lectures, you're not going to be ready for the test. You know, so that's why. Look, look, I, I could not give you all lecture quizzes. Do y'all, hey, okay, do y'all not want lecture quizzes? Because, but I'm going to tell you something. If I don't give you all lecture quizzes at this point, most of you are not going to pass the test because you won't be staying up. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying that to tell you that you're bad people. I'm telling you because you're humans and you have other things to do. So if you're not, if you're not, being required to do it, most people won't do it because you have so much other stuff on your plates. Do you get what I mean? But if y'all say those lecture quizzes are more work for me, how many of you have or get tested every day you come into a class? How many of you have other classes that that happens to you? You know why you don't? Because professors are lazy. I'm lazy too. I don't want to grade anything. I'm lazy. I am. I'm lazier than anybody I know. So if y'all don't want me to, to make you quizzes and, and have and grade these, I'm happy to not. Who wants to stop having lecture quizzes? I mean, I'm seriously asking that. And I've asked that in the past before too, and most people say no. If I'm not having lecture quizzes, I know I wouldn't be passing. What? We enjoy them. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that switching. <laughs> Hey, you know what? Y'all have to suffer through because I know how I am. If I weren't being required to do it, I'd probably think that something else is more taking priority too. And I would do the same. Um, but anyway, so so I hope you all got that. Okay. All right. Now, um, joints. And, and by the way, I could give out that muscles list today, but I don't think I will. I think I, I, I've sent it to the printer, so I could print it and give it to you today. The muscles list that I give you all um, is your word bank that I will give you again for the muscles practical. I actually give you that same word bank and say, these are, these are the muscles, right? Now, it looks like a whole lot of them. It's true. Um, but when we start look, going over the muscle physiology, we're going to talk about how muscles are named. They're named by their regions. So if it's an abdominus muscle, where do you think it is? Abdominal, Abdominal region. You'd be looking near the stomach. When you, if it's a dorsal, if it says dorsi, where are you looking? On the back. So you knew regions, right? That lab too, that was regions. If it's a brachial, where are you looking? The arm. So do you get what I'm saying? So when some people, I've had people take that muscle list and say she lost her friggin' mind, and and other people, and other people outside of the A and P class will see it and say, what class is this? But I have never had a student that once they start looking at the names, they didn't realize they they had learned going along, and they knew because of bones and regions. They knew a lot more than they thought they knew. All right, so so anyway, let's go ahead and talk about joints. So we we talked about bones. We said bones have maybe more functions than we realize. Uh, we certainly knew about movement, didn't we? As as part of the function of bones, and that when muscles are attached to two bones, and then the muscle is going to function, it's going to allow for movement. Where those two bones meet are called articulations, articulations. To articulate is to communicate, isn't that right? To articulate is to communicate. Uh, so articulations are joints, and this is where bones meet and are communicating with each other. How bones are actually classified are gonna be based on what they're made of, if you will, but sometimes also their movement. Am I going to have you? Am I going to have you spend time like memorizing classifications? No, but I do want you to know the basics of this and, and how these joints actually function. So we're going to take a look at this. When we look at certain terminology, you want to be, you want to be articulate and communicate and be able to know this terminology. So arthrology is is going to be the study of joints. 
Ology is the study of arthrology, this articulations. Kinesiology is the study of movement, really. Y'all know kinetic energy is the energy associated with movement, don't you? You learned that in chemistry. So kinesiology <laughs> is the study of certainly the muscles, the skeletal system, and joints, and movement. It's the study of that. Some of you will have to go on and take kinesiology courses because they'll be required of maybe some of your majors. Um, so in a kinesiology course, you're not only learning the muscle's name and the bone's name, but you're learning which bone is the bone of origin and which bone is the bone of insertion. And I've already given you all definitions for that, haven't I? But you'll also learn for each one of those, you'll learn the movement associated with that joint and you will learn the nerve that innervates it. So you'll learn all of that and you'll have an entire class uh, you know, based on that. So, and if you major in that, that will be what you're doing. Now, another term I'd like you to know is a term called diarthrosis. Diarthrosis is referring to a freely movable joint, one that has obvious free movement. So they're, they're sometimes called diarthrotic joints, right? Um, then there's something called sin, which is without sin, without, without movement. Sin is the fix, right? And amphiarthrosis is slightly movable. So that's just kind of terminology for you. Again, do you think I'm going to get you to be able to match classifications? No, no, I, I, I really couldn't care less about those. But there are a couple of things like basic types of joints that I do want you to know. I want you to know that um, sometimes their connections are fibrous, sometimes they're cartilaginous, and sometimes it's bony. We've talked about bony joints already today. What did I tell you about the sacrum and the coccyx? What happens in later 20s, early 30s? They, they fuse. So that's going to be a bony joint. And how about the mandible? Didn't I tell you that that comes together too? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, after birth and, and the frontal bone comes together. So, so osseous or bony joints. Um, so uh, some are fibrous, some are cartilaginous and, and you know, whatever. I want you to know certain terms. If you hear that a joint is a suture, that's only found in the skull. Suture joints are only in the skull. You think you need to know that? Yes. yes, only in the skull. So obviously, they are the joints between skull bones. Now, I also want you to know that when, now you're not gonna, we don't have time for you to learn all of the different sutures but we know this is the frontal, parietal, temporal. Y'all probably know those bones already, hopefully. Frontal, parietal, temporal, occipital back here, right? So as a, a mature skull, that have, these bones have come together. There's certain ways they come together. Some of them are serrated, which y'all know a serrated knife, you know? Some of them are like this. Some of them wrap up, and some of them just butt up together. I don't, you know, I'm not going to ask you that. I just want you to know that this is a pretty tight little joint, isn't it? Now, is there any movement at all? There's a little bit, but not a lot. No, nothing that should be visible, right? But there is actually a little bit of give, but not much, is there? Not in an adult skull. So these are sutures. Now, is there a suture between the, mand the mandibles in the skull? The mandible and the, the other skull bones, is that a suture joint? No, because that's a lot of movement, isn't it? Sutures are, we, we don't expect much movement, <laughs> so we really don't. So that's going to be a different one, isn't it? Now, I also, so with sutures, we know they're kind of special. They're only found in the skull. I want you to know about these thrombosis are called. These are going to be joints between your teeth and bone. So, you know, we talk about joints being two bones meeting, but in this case, it's going to be tooth and bone. Now, wait a minute. Should there be any movement here in teeth and bone? No. no. How many of you all have ever had something stuck in your teeth, but if you just wait a little while, you can get it out, right? Mm -hmm. And that, what happened? There's a little bit, believe it or not, there's a little bit of movement in this joint, and, and this special joint that's only found between teeth and bone. The way that these, this tooth is held to your bone is called a periodontal ligament. What do we know ligaments attached? Bone, 
bone to bone. Ligaments attach bone to bone. But a periodontal ligament is attaching tooth to bone. The most common cause of tooth loss is not cavities. You might think that, but it's not. The most common cause of tooth loss is periodontal disease, which means it's disease at what joint? The gumposis as a disease here. The periodontal ligaments start to break, and there's no pressure being put on this bone now, so the bone starts to do what? Disintegrate. Okay, once one to two, 50% of 20 year olds have the beginning of periodontal disease. You're not alone. So 50% of 20 year olds in our country have the beginning of periodontal disease. There are a lot of different things that can cause it. There is a hereditary component that can happen. Does anybody else think that? My grandma. Okay, so, so what can happen is the um, gum line. If, if there's, if plaque gets under the gum line, plaque gets under this gum line, causing the gums to actually be inflamed. And when these gums get inflamed, it can actually cause fluid to come into the site, but they can, it can start breaking these little ligaments. So the way that they want to see, they scrape down and done any kind of, what are they doing for? They won't give me a regular feeding, they have to be, it has to be special. It has to be a special feeding for it. Because they, they don't want to exacerbate it. Or it like, just a regular oh. yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so which, and you really want to be incredibly proactive because, um, honestly, you know, we take things for granted until we kind of lose them, you know, even our teeth, right? So, um, so just being really proactive, and hopefully, they're doing something for you to help to slow down or reverse the periodontal disease. But once the ligaments are broken, you can't get them back. But you can halt the process by doing being proactive about the process. Uh, do you use like the water pits? And stuff? So you're using the things yeah, that have to be a seat for Yes, yeah. So, and sometimes people, they can go in surgically and do things and, you know, stitch up and do. I've seen that, um, I've seen people who've had that done. But I can't even imagine how painful that, that would be. Um, but but to think that one in that one in two, 50% of 20 year olds have the beginning of periodontal disease and don't know it, most don't know it, uh, is something to be informed about. How many of you work geriatrics? How many of you work in geriatrics and work in skill things? You all know this is the truth. Oral hygiene and oral health, once a person's um, will stop eating the foods that they need to be eating, you can absolutely map their decline. You can map it and see it happen. So oral health is so vital to your overall health. We know that oral health is, um, is what not having the oral health that we need leads to cardiovascular disease, doesn't it? It can lead to GI disorders. Cardiovascular disease, that was one of the number one um, killers of people, though. And so it's just important. It's important. So everybody needs to be aware of that. Gumphos is a special kind of joint, only where? Tooth to bone. Right. So maxillary and mandible, right? Bones. Maxillary, mandible, bones, teeth. So uh, synthesmosis, this is an, uh, an, uh, a membrane that allows for like supination, pronation, and very tight special kinds of movements that we see in this forearm and even between the tibia and the fibula. But anyway, I don't think I even ask you all about that, this, but that is a, another, I don't even ask you about it, but it is a membrane that allows for that. Um, these, these cartilaginous joints, cartilage found between vertebra and between like the pubic synthesis, does this allow for movement? Mm -hmm. Certainly it does. It does allow for movement, right? Um, so, I mean, it's not a whole lot of movement, but it's movement. We definitely have movement here. And is it cushioning between the bones? Do we want a bone that's two-third crystal hard and complex? Do we want it rubbing against another bone? Mm -hmm. No, we absolutely don't. And so there needs to be between these special joints, these synthesis joints, um, this cartilage that is actually going to be supporting that. Now, here's what 
we said that some are going to be bony joints, meaning ossification is going to happen at a certain time, and then there's zero movement. There's none. There's not even microscopic movement. It's bone, isn't it? So, okay. Now, this next, this is really what this chapter is about, is about the diarthritic joints. And what did I say diarthritis means? Freely movable. Which joints have the most injuries, do you think? Which group of joints do you think has the most injuries? Oh, yes. be these, the ones where you do have movement, because you end up doing movements that you shouldn't do. <laughs> Those joints, and then that can cause problems. So freely movable diarthritic joints are going to be the synovial joints. Synovial joints. And I want to, uh, they're classified based on the type of movement that you see in the joint. Again, I'm not going to have you all have to memorize those. Uh, some of them are just self-explanatory, but I'm not going to question you about that. I am going to question you about diaphragmatic joints, knowing that they're synovial joints, that this is the most free movement that we have or with these joints. And what are some common characteristics of synovial joints? Maybe it makes sense to you that these are the most complex joints. You know, it's not so complex when two bones do this, is it? Like sutures. Or about a, that's not so complex. Or when there's a piece of cartilage between two bones. That's not so complex either. But look at these synovial joints, which allow for free movement, these diaphragmatic joints. Let's look at them. They're going to have certain things in common. For one thing, the ends of the two bones that meet are going to be encapsulated. Those ends, this is the end of a bone, this is the end of a bone, where they be, there's going to have to be this encapsulated space. So this encapsulated space here, and there inside there's the synovial membrane that's secreting a fluid. Guess what the fluid's called? Synovial fluid. That's exactly right. Synovial fluid needs to be clear, colorless, and it's viscous, which means that it's kind of slippery thick. It, you can think of it sort of like as a raw egg white, you know, the, the raw egg whites. It's slippery, but it should be clear, it should be colorless, and it is slippery and it is thick, kind of. And it's perfect. It's perfect. What it has in it is going to be these enzymes that keep the joint sterile, because certainly it should be sterile, um, but also is going to encourage the health of the ends of these bones. At the end, of the bones that meet in a synovial joint is going to always be something, or it should be, it's called articular cartilage. So we said to articulate just means to communicate, it means to join, is a joint, it's joint cartilage. So what happens do you think if articular cartilage at the end of your bone starts to thin or wear out? That means bone will start rubbing against bone, and that's going to cause inflammation of the joint. I want to, what is the word we use for inflammation of a joint? Arthritis. Is arthritis a definitive diagnosis? No, it just simply means there's inflammation in a joint. Inflammation, uh, what comes along with inflammation is pain. So pain in a joint is arthritis, but that's not telling you why somebody has arthritis, is it? There are a lot of different causes of arthritis. If somebody has pain in a joint, do you think they deserve a definitive diagnosis? If somebody has arthritis, do you think they deserve a definitive diagnosis? I think so too. So let me tell you the most common cause for arthritis. The most common cause of arthritis is something called osteoarthritis. One word, osteoarthritis. It's the most common joint disease, is osteoarthritis. It is a definitive diagnosis. What osteoarthritis is, you could say it's just normal wear and tear and aging of a joint. Look, guys, you know, I tell people don't age unless you have a sense of humor. But, but honestly, as we age, what do you think happens to the, the articular cartilage that's having to rebuild itself over years and years and years? It wears down. It wears down. And it loses the ability to replace itself. So it's getting thinner, isn't it? And it can cause some pain in the joints. 
So osteoarthritis is really a natural progression that can happen with this age of panic. It doesn't mean that you tell somebody to go home and live with it, you know, but, but, but it, it can happen. Now, can we actually abuse our joints? Yeah. yeah so, um, but now people are just so much more in tune to knowing what can cause joint damage. So, so even in just the last few decades, people are, like athletes especially, are so much better at taking care of their joints and warming up before, uh, you know, any kind of strenuous joint pain. If you just take a few minutes to warm up a joint, it warms up the synovial fluid, and guess what will happen to this articular cartilage? With just a, it's not even, it's a fraction of a degree temperature change. This cartilage will absorb, this, this articular cartilage will absorb the synovial fluid and puff up. Just like when you pour water on a sponge, what will the sponge do? This is why warming up before you do anything is just so important, right? Um, it, it, because it can save your joints over time. All right, so anyway, so all synovial joints are encapsulated. All synovial joints are producing synovial fluid on a daily basis. And that means that this, the old synovial fluid is being reabsorbed and taken out and being replaced. What would happen if you had too much synovial fluid coming in? Would that be a problem? Yeah. What would happen if you didn't have enough? Would that be a problem? You need to have it just right, don't you? So um, that's right. And we said at the end, at the end of these bones, there's going to be articular cartilage at the end of these bones that are cushioning. Now I want to tell you something else that you can find in some synovial joints. In some synovial joints, there's going to be, um, not in that one, in some synovial joints, there's going to be an extra little pad. Oh, I wanted it to be red. But there's an extra little pads of fiber cartilage that actually will act as cushions. Where would, what synovial joints would we need extra pads to cushion? Like any joint that has a lot of pressure, right? Like your knees. How about your, how about the man did the, the temporal mandibular joint? Where would the temporal mandibular joint be? Oh wait, I know where the temporal bone is, and I know where the mandible is. So right here, why would we need a, a, a little extra fiber cartilage pad here? Because this is a ton of pressure. When you bite down and chew on things, this is a powerful joint. The knees, right? This is called a meniscus. A meniscus is a joint that has joints that have meniscus or menisci, plural. They're going to be joints that have a ton of power associated with them, right? Pressure and power. Now, there's also something called, uh, so, so you see this here. You see a meniscus, a pad of fiber cartilage. Now, you guys, you also will see bursa here. And bursa are going to be these sacs that are filled with synovial fluid that help tendons. As, you know, as a joint changes shape, as a joint changes shape, Y'all know that tendons attach muscle to bones, right? So, and you know that skeletal muscle is attached to two different bones. So those tendons that attach muscle to bone, they're, they're sheathed. Sheathed, the feather. Did y'all hear the word I said that? Mm -hmm. I said it weird, but did you get it? It's the sheath has this, this synovial to help it glide across the joint as it changes shape. So can you have bursitis? Yeah. What would bursitis mean? Inflammation. Inflammation of that synovial filled sac for the tendon. So that means anytime you have movement, there's probably hurting, isn't it? If you have bursitis, right? Okay. So, are we good? So we know articular cartilage is at the end of two bones in the synovial joint. We know that there's synovial fluid that has to be continually being replaced. Um, we know that arthritis just means pain in a joint, but the most common cause of arthritis is osteoarthritis. What are some other causes of arthritis? Pain in a joint. Huh. Yes, yeah, so trauma. <laughs> trauma certainly can affect joints. Not doesn't always just affect like you know uh, the diathesis of a of a bone. It can also affect in the joint. So trauma can definitely be. What else? What, what, yeah, so, but, but usually something precedes that. What precedes that? So it could be osteoarthritis that's preceded needing surgical uh, replacement. 
a prosthetic uh, infection. You can have infection in a joint. So um, microbes that can get in our system, and again, it's again, or good oral health, microbes that can get in our system through our mouth. Is our mouth very vascular? Yeah. It can move to joints and cause bacterial infections, viral infections. Um, you can have gonorrhea in a joint. Yeah, some people are like, what, what gonorrhea? I thought that was like a sexually transmitted disease. It is. But there's something called oral sex that you can have, right? And with this, this can actually get in the system, move to a joint. I've seen people come in and they'll, they'll aspirate the joint. They'll take fluid off the joint. The joint is like double the size it should be. And it's hot. The joint's hot. And you can see it's like there's no fluid. And the fluid is not clear and colorless. It is cloudy. It, there's white cells there. And you cultrasound it, it ends up being, it doesn't, it's not always fine real, but, but I've seen gonococcal um, arthritis before. So you can have gonococcal pharyngitis. So, okay, just saying. Um, so infections, infections can get to joints. They can, a lot of times, see they're seeded through the mouth. Um, you can have autoimmune diseases that cause arthritis. What autoimmune diseases cause arthritis? Y'all know an autoimmune disease means your own immune system cells, instead of protecting you, which they do an amazing job of, they've now turned against you and are attacking tissues. What, which ones can cause arthritis? Which autoimmune diseases can cause arthritis? Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease. It can happen at any age. You can have childhood rheumatoid arthritis. Devastating, isn't it? Every time there's an arthritic event in the joint, typically you're going to get some permanent things that can be lost in that joint. So you try for that not to happen. But rheumatoid arthritis is this chronic thing that's happening. Autoimmune disease. How about lupus? Can that affect the joints? How about psoriasis? That's a skin. What are you talking about? That's a skin autoimmune disease. Can it affect the joints? It can. It can affect the joints. So there are other autoimmune diseases that can actually um, affect joints as well. Okay, so there are a lot of different things that can cause arthritis. Again, the most common cause of arthritis is wear and tear and abuse of joints sometimes. Um, okay, so we said that the synovial joints have different movements. Some are ball and socket, right? We saw the oscoxate, the acetabulum, and the head of the femur is a ball in a cup depression, the acetabulum, right? So you get this a lot of movement with these, don't you? Where else in the body other than the hip do you have a ball and a socket? Very good. So I want, again, for this humerus bone, when y'all are looking at the humerus bone, well, let's look here. You see the ball is an obvious ball in a cup. The humerus isn't so, as obvious, but it's a half of a little ball, isn't it? So when you look at this end, no other bone has that little ball like that that's half there. No other little bone has that. So pay attention to that. So a ball and socket, and you get a ton of movement with ball and socket joints, don't you? Now, I'm not going to ask you about these movements. I'm really not, but I think they're kind of common sense. A hinge is this monoaxial, meaning like a hinge, like a door hinge. You can get this kind of movement, right? Some of them are hinge. The saddle is your thumb, and that's the only place there is that. The saddle is this thumb. This is why we have opposable thumbs, and we can pick things up, right? Primates have opposable thumbs, meaning that we can take our thumbs and touch the fingertips, our other fingertips, right? We can pick things up, and, and, put a, and primates have that. It's unique because of this saddle joint that we have. Um, great. Pivot joints, guess what they do? Pivot. That's what they do. Gliding joints, and you might not think about those little carpal bones, but y'all are looking at the carpal and the tarsal bones. You're going to be thinking, they don't, but there's not movement there, is it? Yes, there is. And they glide, and there's gliding movement, and there needs to be gliding movement at these joints. Yes, there are. Ellipsoid or condyloid, these are going to be um, where you're thinking of these uh, metacarpals and whatnot, so that's that. And so we get 
we get, anytime you can actually see movement, if you can see movement, it's probably a what joint? Synovial. I want y'all to think about all those synovial joints that we have, just in our hands and our feet, think about. Those synovial joints that we have, every single one of them, every single one of them, their synovial fluid being secreted every day and being reabsorbed, and the articular cartilage is being maintained, and menisci are need to be working in some of them that have this time, right? And <coughs> they're complicated. Those joints are kind of complicated, aren't they? Because movement is going to require that intricate type of, of anatomy. Are we good with that? So synovial joints. All right. Now I'm going to talk about the movements because that's the main thing in this chapter is that you know when you hear a word, you can imagine the movement. When you hear, this is your goal. When you hear some of these terms, you can imagine what that movement is. Now, before I say these movements, you have to understand it's, these movements are always determined from anatomical position. So what is anatomical position? Like this. Did y'all see me? Like this. So every, every one of these, when you hear that somebody has, um, has lost range of motion, reflection at the whatever site, y'all know that it's from anatomical position that they're talking about. Okay? All right, so that's just, um, that's, it has to be understood from the get-go. But, so flexion. Flexion is when you are decreasing the angle of a joint. And when I say decreasing the angle, could I measure from anatomical position, could I measure how much of an angle this is at the elbow? This would be like 180, wouldn't it? But if it's now all of a sudden, you know, 90, right? I'm decreasing at 45, right? So decreasing the angle of a joint. How about this? Is What is this at the wrist? Flexion, isn't it? How about, how about, this at the knee. So see y'all could play with that and think about that. That's a flex, that's flexion, isn't it? Decreasing the angle of the joint. If you go back to anatomical position, that's called what? Extension. extension. You're going back to the anatomical position. That's extension. Some people lose that. So, you know, it's not that they've lost flexion. They just can't go back to extension. Do you get what I mean? So you can lose one or the other of any of these. The reason I'm telling all these is just be nerdy is so that if you see on your patient's chart that they, you know, have whatever, you would kind of know what they might not be able to do, okay? Um, hyperextension means that you go beyond that angle. There are some joints that should never be hyperextended. How about your elbow? Do you want that hyperextended? How about your knee? I just flexed it and I just extended it, but do I ever want hyperextension of the knee? Uh -huh. No. Yeah. They told me four years that I hyperextended my uh, my left knee. Huh. Well, See, I, was, st I was standing up while well, I was bent over up by my waist watching the baseboard and it snapped and popped and I flipped backwards. Uh -huh. So, uh, what they do for it? Brace? Just a brace. A brace. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, yeah, well, t usually what's helping the joints to be stable, each of our joints have ligaments. So between the two bones, you know, between the, the femur and the tibia and the fibula, there's going to be these ligaments stabilized, right? So we'll look at some of these ligaments. Um, but in any joint, there are going to be these ligaments between the, the bones at the joint, the stabilized joints. So they don't do things they shouldn't be doing. Um, but that sounds horrible. Now, so you can see there's some, though, there's some regions that can do at all, if that's normal for it to be able to do all, so flexion, extension, and hyperextension. Abduction and adduction. Adduction is moving away from the midline, and adduction is moving back. Do we know what the midline is, the medial region or midline? So adduction, adduction. If y'all play with these movements and do them yourself while you're saying them, would you be able to answer them on the quiz Thursday? When I'm asking you to fill in the blank, when I say decreasing the angle of the joint would be called, you would write flexion, 
going back to anatomical position, what we call extension, going beyond hyperextension prep. So moving a, a structure away from the midline. How about this? Our hands right here in anatomical position. How about if I took my phalanges and went like that? What is that? That's adduction. How about if I go back? How about if I take my arms? I'm adducting my arms. I'm adducting them now. Right? So you guys just, just do some of this. Elevate means to do what? Bring it up and then bring them down. Depression, right? Protraction and retraction. Protraction is moving something along an anterior plane, which is front. Retraction is bringing it back, right? Uh, we use some of these movements for chewing and um, you know whatever. So that's what that is. How about lateral? What did lateral mean? Do you see lab two? Lab two. Was that important? What does lateral mean? To the side. Medial means toward the what? Midline. Yep, yep. So medial and lateral excursion. And then in those ball and socket joints, what did we say we had? Yeah, this we had a lot of, we had the most movement in ball and socket, shoulder and hip joints. And we had this circumduction that we can do with the ball and socket joints, which is you know, whatever. So how about, um, how about that, guys? Y'all good? Here's something I want you to know. Supination and pronation. Supination is an anatomic, palms are in anatomical position, supinated, pronated. Y'all can think about P, posterior. Palms, posterior is pronation, PPP, right? Palms to the posterior is pronation. Why is that important? Combing your hair, brushing your teeth, turning a doorknob. Doesn't it take all of that for, for supination, pronation for those things? It really does, right? Right. Um, now, this will talk about your feet too, but when you typically hear supination, pronation, I really want you all to realize that that's usually about these hands. It's not usually talking about the feet, it's the hands. So guess where you find the supinator and the pronator muscles in this these forearms? Because isn't that where this is originating? It is. So if y'all see on your muscle list, list the supinator and the pronator teres and pronator quadratus, where are you looking? Don't be putting those up in the head somewhere, okay? I'm just saying. So if you know these movements, is that going to help you with muscles? It's certainly going to help you with muscles. Um, great. These are two movements we think of with the foot, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Dorsiflexion, you're raising your toes up, up like to walk so that you don't trip. You're dorsiflexing, you're raising your toes up, and there's a certain range of motion you should have with that. Plantar flexion is like standing on your tiptoes, Every time you walk, because y'all might be thinking, well, you know, when I do that, you do that every time you take a step. Every time you take a step, you do a coordinated dorsiflexion, then plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. You're doing it all the time. As we age, do we lose a little bit of that? Mm -hmm. So what do you find older people doing? Stumbling, which can lead to falling. That's exactly right especially older people who have metabolic disorders like diabetes that can affect the neurons. Because it doesn't take nerves talking to muscles to get you to do that. You know, we don't have to think about it. If we just want to go, we're going to go, right? Mm -hmm. But we have to do that and make a choice to walk, which is sending signals to motor neurons, which I haven't talked about muscles yet, but we will, that allow us to do that. But the coordination gets a little bit slow, gets a little bit off as we age. And, and especially if you have metabolic disorders like diabetes and or any other thing that can affect the nervous system. So they fall more often and have more of a, uh, a risk of falling, right? But is that a serious risk? Can you hurt yourself falling? Yeah, you really can. So, um, so great. Dorsiflexion, know what it is. Plantar flexion, know what it is. I want you all to sit there where you are and do this inversion. It's not much of a movement to do the inversion where your, your soles of your feet are pointing to each other. 
Don't use the floor to help you. Lift up your feet. Yep. And now do eversion. So inversion, <laughs> eversion. It's not much movement, but guess what? It's so important for us to have agility as we walk, to have that. People who lose that. And guess what is thought now orthopedic space? Because of humans wearing shoes and being on, on human-made sur human surfaces, do they require much of this? Yeah. They really don't require much of this. So I feel so sorry for little kids who I see in shoes so often and that don't ever get to go out and just be barefoot in nature. Because the, the fact is, they're not developing the same way. They're not getting that, that movement. They're always walking on man-made surfaces. They're always, so do you think they're gonna have more ankle issues? Yeah. They seriously are. And more agility issues, they are. So, um, so anyway, that's that. Now, those movements, flexion, extension, hyperextension, abduction, adduction, um, Protraction, retraction, those things we just talked about, right? Supination, pronation, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. Know them. Know them well enough that you can use them in sentences. All right? Know them well enough that you could use them in sentences. Here's what I, I want you all to realize, though, and um, hold on with me for a minute. For every one of you're, you're picturing somebody in anatomical position, aren't you? So for every joint that a human being has, it has been studied extensively. For every joint that a human being has, there's a known expected range of motion that should be at that joint. Fair enough? Is that fair enough? And this range of motion, like a physical therapist or a PTA or whatever, they know exactly for each of those joints, the muscles involved, the nerves involved, the joint, the, the bones themselves, and what range of motion should be at that joint. Some joints have very little, like inversion, inversion, very little expected range of motions, and some have should have more, right? Fair enough? All right. They can measure the angles of these joints with a simple little protractor type thing. And it's just a little paper thing. They can see the angle of the joint. It's called a goniometer. Is that up there? Yeah, so, so it's called a goniometer. They can keep that in their, their pocket, right? And they can see, okay, move. Get, give me your best movement at that joint. How far can you bend that joint? And then they measure it and they say, okay, well, you've lost a certain percent. We're going to try to get you back some, some movement, right? So that's what they're trying to do. Fair enough? All right, so, so that's what they're trying to do. But I want you all to realize that your joints, every single one of them, every single one of your joints are actually levers. Do y'all remember in high school physics class, you learned about levers, you learned about first, second, third degree levers. Do y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you remember levers. Now look, do you think I'm gonna have you go back and remember fulcrum and advantage and effort and resistance arms? I'm not. I'm not, but maybe you'll take my word for it. Is it, maybe you'll take my word for it if you remember that when you're thinking about levers, levers give us a mechanical advantage, don't they? We use levers to give us a mechanical advantage, either power or speed, right? Do y'all remember that? And the class of the lever was always, for a second, you don't need to know this part, but if you remember, the class of the lever was always determined by what was in the center. So fulcrum being in the center first, or effort being in the center, or resistance being in the center. Do y'all remember? And, and I'm not going to ask you that, but do you remember that? Do y'all remember that? So like first class, you see the fulcrum. Second class, you, you're seeing the resistance. Third class, you're seeing the effort, right? And you remember, you kind of remember that these were giving us mechanical advantage. Is that right? Okay, so every single one of your joints are that way. They're either, and they've, been, they've already been evaluated. We, they've already been measured to be, to know which class of lever they are. So, so you don't have to do it, but we know that how they do it. This mechanical advantage is going to be determined by taking the length of the effort arm and dividing it by the length of the resistance arm. 
That's how it's determined. That's how it's been determined for every single joint we have. The mechanical advantage is you take the length of the effort and divide it by the length of the resistance arm. That's how, I just want you to know how they determined it. Now, if it's less than one, if the number you come up with was less than one, it's already been done. We know that that joint is going to give us speed. If it's greater than one, then we know that this joint is going to be a powerful joint. So every single joint's already been done in orthopedics. It's been determined. And our joints give us speed or what? Power. You get it? They give us speed and power. And they're, they're amazing. And again, you know what we do? We take advantage. I mean, we, we just really don't appreciate them until they're gone, <laughs> until we can't use them anymore. And then it becomes like, oh, my gosh, I really miss that, you know? Um, so anyway, each joint. Mechanical advantage. How is it determined? Tell me what you wrote down. The length of the effort arm divided by the length of the what? Are you going to ever have to do it? No, because it's already been done in orthopedics. But if the number is less than one, what do you know you have at that joint? Speed. And if it's greater than one, what do you have at that joint? Power. Power. Right. So that's exactly right. Now, are we good so far? All right. So these next slides are actually going through some of the major joints. Um, there's only a couple of things I want you to get from this because, again, you know, we just, we just don't go that deep into this, but for one thing, the joints are easy to know what the joint they're talking about because of the bones, right? So the temporal mandibular joint, we, we, we know that this is a joint that is going to allow for that mandible to freely move. And was it the only freely movable bone in the skull? Mm -hmm. Then I would talk about that. It's the only freely movable bone in the skull. And is it important that it could move more than just for talking? Y'all probably wish I'd stop, but more than just for talking. For chewing, isn't it? Because, you know, the old saying, you are what you eat, well, some old saying, you are what you eat, right? So we need to be able to um, bring in nutrients and chew them. The first part of digestion is actually mechanically breaking particles down. So having um, having the teeth to do that. So it takes a lot for that mandibular joint. I do want you to know that there is, and this is a physiology thing, there is something called TMJ um, disorder. So some people say, I have TMJ. Well, guess what? We all have TMJ. We all have a temporal mandibular joint, right? But what they really mean is that they have TMJ disorder or syndrome. Syndrome. So uh, has anybody known anybody with this? It's only fairly recently, but I'd want to say maybe in the last decade, that this has been recognized as a true disorder. Uh, before, I think that there were some physicians who were probably thinking that people were um, exas exaggerating signs and symptoms of this. But now it's considered a, a, a disorder. You can imagine, since the joint is here in this temporal region, where the auditory ossicles are right behind this area, you can have a lot of things with the hearing. You can have ringing in your ears. You get uh, tinnitus, or some people say tinnitus, but it's tinnitus. This can cause this ringing in the ears. You can actually have vertigo, where you feel like you're moving, but you're not, which can cause you to be incredibly nauseous. There can be pain in the joints that lead to headaches. There have been people who said that this has kept them from sleeping, which can then lead to psychosis. Yes? Can, it, can pregnancy cause it? Pregnancy can actually, for a lot of disorders, um, exacerbate certain disorders. So um, I, they, they really don't say pregnancy causes it. Supposedly, it's caused from malocclusion, which is meaning your bite is off. Your bite isn't right. So because the bite's off, you've got this, the joint is getting uneven pressure, and it's such a powerful joint anyway, it starts to tear down the joint on, on one side or the other. Gosh, I just keep, I just keep on coming. Fun. So that's so crazy. I just 
this guy found a Okay. Okay. I, I think I probably just wrote it down somewhere. Thank you, Rodnita. So this one is still open. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um. So stress, stress can cause us to do what? Run our teeth and pregnancy can certainly sometimes be stressful in Canada. So, um, it, I mean, stress can do that and, and whatnot, but it's, it's considered to be because of malocclusion. Now, they really don't know for sure still so what, what can cause this sometimes. Uh, but I think one of the first things they usually try to do is to correct the body. Um, anyway, and just because you might have clicking and just because you feel you know, when you go to a dentist, that's one of the first things they say is, you know, they put their fingers here and they ask you to open up your mouth. And they can feel it or you can hear it sometimes clicking. I had a student one time that was sitting like in the back of the room and she said, my, you can hear mine probably come up there. And that's what she's a little bit all here. It's like popping. Is somebody doing that here? Is that you? Okay. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, if there is malocclusion, if there is malocclusion, that can actually lead to periodontal disease. Because if teeth are not meeting, then teeth will super erupt. And so as they super erupt, it can actually cause periodontal ligaments to be compromised. So that might be your issue with that. Um, so anyway, the humoroscapular joint, y'all know the humerus and the scapula. So this is the shoulder. This is a, um, you know, shoulder jo joint. Y'all often hear about shoulder injuries, don't you? And again, because it's so freely movable. But the rotator cuff is this area where these tendons are attaching and stabilizing this joint. So you can have rotator cuff tears. And so when they go in here, they're usually trying to repair these tendons that are attached here. Anybody ever had rotator cuff surgery or know somebody? It used to be that they just were hoping that you get rid of pain. They weren't really even caring about range of motion, getting that back, right? Um, but now they can do pretty amazing things with rotator cuff surgeries. Um, and people, have you ever heard of frozen shoulders? Have you heard of frozen, frozen shoulders? Meaning you've lost the motion. Again, you take it for granted, but if you can't raise your arm up, you can't brush your hair, right? Some of the most basic hygiene things you, you can't do, which Again, you send tendency to people get depressed. Uh, you know, they, they have issues after that. I have a question. Yeah. If people tear their rotator cuff, how long, like if it's not that big of a tear, they, how long can it? Yeah, it would just take, it just depends. And you know, an orthopedic person, they're going to assess that by doing like MRIs and um, scans to see whether it requires going in and doing surgery to try to repair it and or not. But then it also depends on the person's overall health. Do, does it make a difference in what a person's doing that has an injury to their diet? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Their diet can play a huge role in how quickly they um, recover. It can play just a huge role. Like you would think with this that the shoulder might be one of the most complicated joints, the shoulder and the hip, but actually the knee is the most complicated joint, and that was the only, uh, and I don't really ask you anything other than to know rotator cuff me is referring to those tendons that stabilizing the shoulder. You'll hear a lot of people call it a cuff, right? It kind of does look like a cuff, doesn't it? It almost looks like a cuff in that, that humorous head, but anyway, it's rotator cuff. Um, the elbow, the hip, the hip, when people, are these joints, do they require blood supply? Yes. Absolutely require a blood supply. Don't they? So if there's blood supply that's lost to these joints, then you can actually have this bone die, and they're going to have to be replaced. There's going to have to be a replacement there. The, the serious part, well, that's all serious, but this, the real serious part about hip replacements or knee replacements is that we have now, we have now people, um, do the replacements last forever? No, they don't. And so they kind of hope for about 15 years. We have people now getting joint replacements that are outliving their replacements. 
So then I'm having to go in and go up and redo it again, which is a serious thing because, um, you know, there's, there's serious risk to these. If infection happens at these joints, they're going to have to go in and take that out and just leave them open, um, you know, after surgery. They're also, you know, can go to the bloodstream and then the person becomes septic and that's a life-threatening event, isn't, isn't it? One in four people got sepsis with the best medical care. No matter what it's going to be done, they're going to go. And that's not a good odd, is it? To um, those odds aren't great. So this is these are like, yeah, amazing things are being done, but it's still kind of, um, you know, it's still definitely a risk. And it is true that we are now having. Why do you think that um, that's happening? That people are having knee replacement for the main thing. Why do you think that that's happening? Why why are orthopedic people telling us that people are outliving their knees? What is causing people to need knee replacements so early? Weight. Obesity. It's exactly right. More than 30, um, more than a third of the developing countries' populations are morbidly obese, which means that this is adversely affecting their health. More than 75% are overweight. Um, and if you look at, if you look at, I, I had somebody look this up not long ago, and I forgot the actual number, but it's kind of shocking. This is why they say if you can use glues just a little bit of weight, it can really help your joints. Because if you, for every one pound, it's something crazy, like every one pound of inner of weight that you have over that you should be for your size, uh, it puts something crazy like another 50 pounds of pressure on the knees. So just, it's not that, but it's, it's a lot. It's something exaggerated. What you say? Yeah, it's something exaggerated. I, I, I think, yeah, so I think it was like five pounds of weight is 50 feet. So five pounds away would be 50, so whatever. But it's something really exaggerated. So if you lose a little bit of weight, can it really help your knees? It can really help your knees. So that's what they say. You know, I think people get discouraged because they think, oh, well, they don't want to need to lose all this time away, but I can't do that. But just thinking about it a little bit can help with them. Um, again, knees. Knees are the most complex. Y'all got a clinical insight, a deeper insight about knees being the most complex. And look at all of the ligaments that are stabilizing that knee. Because we are bipedal. And because we're bipedal, that knee takes a lot, right? So you've got the anterior cruciate ligament, which is the one that's the most injured anterior medial knee. You know, I don't ask you to do it, but you'll read this. Um, so, and you've got medial ligaments and lateral ligaments and posterior ligaments. So these, these ligaments are all trying to help absorb some of that and keeping it stable. So it is considered the most complex joint. And then the ankle joint. I think we talked a little bit about the ankle, uh, you know, whatever. Um, this is a good picture of the talus, which is a, one of the tarsal bones fitting and how that tibia fits right in that talus for that joint, you know, that joint. And then um, the fibula being that outer ankle, some people call it the ankle bone, that outer one. But it's often injured too, because of course we can rotate our, um, we, can, we can rotate that ankle and, and it won't hurt. Mm -hmm. So arthritis is really a catch-all phrase, isn't it? It's an umbrella phrase, it is not a diagnosis. This means that you have inflammation at a joint, which means that you probably have swelling and pain at the joint. But you really need to find out why. And as we said, these are some of the different reasons why. Now, if things get bad enough, um, then certainly arthroplasty, we can actually get replaced. And so you can see, um, you can see some of the prosthetics that they can put in. Has anybody ever uh, seen an orthopedic surgery unit? So, so how, how does it sound and look to you, maybe? <laughs> Did, have, you, have you witnessed them? Yeah, I don't know how older people are. Wow. You, you it really makes sense to me it looks like they're taking apart. It is just a butcher shop. It is. It is a butcher shop, period. It really is. Like, I, a lot of times they want older people to just know what's going on, whatever. They don't want them. Don't tell them something. Don't tell them Just don't even show, don't, don't show them a video. Don't do it. Um, it's, it's just something, oh, and you just, you do, you just have to wonder, don't you? It's amazing what they can do, but then people feel better. Um, but it works, I, I just, whoa, there's just the sounds in, a, in an orthopedic surgery unit is just 
crazy. But these, and when you look at these prosthetics, you can see why it would sound like that. Um, I do want to tell you all about something called ankylosing arthritis. Ankylosing arthritis is when you have such serious inflammation. Like, look, can you just like rub them? Like, oh, except they probably hurt. There's so much, oh my goodness, the pain. I can't even imagine. I mean, you'll feel the heat and you'll see the swelling. It's just so bad. And so, when you have ankylosing arthritis, it isn't just in the hands, it can be in the spine. It can just be in any of the joints. And when this happens, is there any, they're, they're hurting and they're not even moving. It's hurting all the time. And so what they will sometimes do with ankylosing arthritis is they'll go in and actually cause the bones to fuse. They'll try to get the bones to fuse. So then it will stop any movement. And so can you imagine a person hurting so badly that they say, yeah, I just would rather not be able to have any movement than have this kind of pain. Um, that's really awful. So um, usually it's the, it's the autoimmune diseases that lead to something like this, this type of arthritis. Um, do y'all have any questions about joints? So joints allow for movement, don't they? And joints act as levers, and different movements have different terms that we use with them, right? Mm -hmm. And we learn some basic anatomy about the joints, especially the synovial joints. We learn about bursa and meniscus and what articular cartilage is. Right? Uh, and synovial fluid. And how synovial fluid is just a perfect lubricant um, for, for two bones that are meeting. The perfect kind of lubricant. Um, I yell for you. Feel okay? All right. Um, I want to now, I want to now just do a little bit with muscles. But it's just a story that I want to tell you. Do y'all want to break before I tell you a story about muscles? Yes, please. Okay. Let's do about, let's do 12 minute break. Is that all right? Is that enough? Do y'all want longer? Do y'all want like a month? Do y'all want a month? Like 30 minutes or something? <laughs> all right, 12 minutes. 12 minutes. Jump up and down. <laughs> Uh, just admit it. Just admit it on that. All right, look. But but first, I want to tell you a story. But I want you to, while you're listening to this story, I want you to realize that after I finish the story, I'm going to break it down so that you have time to write the steps of the story down. So right now, I'd like everybody to put their pencils down. Thank you. Because here's your story. But you can't go to sleep. All right. It's not a bedtime story. All right. But what I want you all to, to hear is how, uh, this is a story about skeletal muscle. And we just talked about joints and anytime skeletal muscle is acting, it's causing movement, isn't it? For each skeleton, now this is just skeletal muscle. We know about cardiac muscle, we know about smooth, but I'm just talking about skeletal muscle, which is under voluntary control. So anytime skeletal muscle does this movement. I'm going to tell you all a story about what has to happen first until and all the steps in between until the very end. Okay, so there's a beginning and there's an end to the story. And just like most stories, they won't make sense to you or they won't make as much sense, sense unless you know every part of the story. Is that right? And just like the reason I try to tell you all why I'm wanting you to know the things I want you to know, is that you can only understand if you if you know what's supposed to happen you can only understand disease if you know what part of the story the problem came in do you get what i'm saying mm -hmm. so i'm not getting you to know these stories mariah without your pencil right nobody's got pencils right everybody's just listening right everybody's just listening so the reason I'm going to want you to know the story, and it sounds very sequential, and it makes sense why <laughs> this thing happens, causing this next thing to happen, causing this next thing to happen, is because there's certain diseases that affect those very particular steps. So how would we treat them? By knowing those steps, what's happening there, and that's how we go about treating them. So let me tell you about skeletal muscle contractions and innervations that give us movement. You ready? Don't. Don't write this down. I want you all to just listen, okay? For a skeletal muscle, which we're gonna say our room is a skeletal muscle fiber, 
you all have looked at them under the slides, haven't you? You've seen what skeletal muscle fibers look like, haven't you? So in our room, we are a skeletal muscle fiber. For uh, this fiber, for us to get a signal to contract on the outside of the muscle, there must be a functioning motor neuron, nervous cell. So once upon a time, there is this functioning motor neuron that is going to release a molecule, a molecule called a neurotransmitter that ends up traveling across a space to get to the skeletal muscle fiber. It has to travel across this space called the synapse so that it can actually knock on the door of a receptor. Remember there are protein receptors on our plasma membranes of a skeletal muscle fiber. And this skeletal muscle, muscle fiber must have a very particular skeletal protein receptor that recognizes it and opens the door and says, well, as that neurotransmitter causes that door to open, there's sodium outside of our cells in very high concentrations. Remember, sodium is the main extracellular cation. With the door open, guess what sodium's going to do? It's going to rush in. That's called diffusion. But we already have a positively charged cation in here called potassium. So when sodium pours in, potassium's going to say, oh, they'll repel each other. Potassium's going to rush out. And when they're meeting here at the membrane, it shocks the membrane of the skeletal muscle. Motor neuron, send a transmitter across this space to open the protein receptor doorway. Sodium poured in, potassium poured out, shocking the membrane, sending an electrical shock all through the fiber, right? Shocked. In the skeletal muscle, there is an endoplasmic reticulum. Have y'all ever heard of endoplasmic reticulum? And, and sarco is just referring to the muscle part. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is storing calcium. It's got it stored in its membrane. But as an electrical shock moves through the muscle fiber, calcium gets released and just floods, calcium floods into the muscle fiber. When calcium floods into the muscle fiber, there a muscle, do y'all remember the skeletal muscle, the little striations? Mm -hmm. Those are, those are contractile proteins called actin and myosin that are interwoven, minding their own business in a relaxed muscle. But when calcium comes and floods the cell, it is going to act on the actin, releasing binding sites so that when those binding sites are open, actin and myosin will form cross bridges. And as the cross bridges are formed, what will the whole fiber do? <laughs> yeah, will contract. So calcium flooded, acted on actin, which is interwoven with myosin, so that cross bridges can form, and now it's contracted, so we're contracted. Can that be the end of the story? Better not be the end of the story. We already said how it's the same muscle contraction. It's not good news, right? So what is going to happen? is that we've got ATP in our cells. Where do we get ATP in our muscle cells from? The mitochondria gives us the most of it, right? There's ATP, and ATP immediately starts breaking the cross bridges so that actin and myosin can go back to their relaxed state. Calcium, when it flooded the cell, it's just like a wave hitting the shore. It floods the cell, but it will almost immediately start going back to the endoplasmic reticulum getting out of the way so that those, those binding sites get locked again so that relaxation is occurring. Out here, that neurotransmitter is being diluted, so the doorway is starting to what? Close. Close. Part of the relaxation, right? So that now we had an entire cycle. We had a motor neuron sending a signal. It caused a shock, didn't it? The shock released the calcium into the entire fiber. Actin and myosin were able to form cross bridges and contract, but we have ATP. 
So ATP started breaking them. Calcium went back to the endoplasmic reticulum to be stored for the next contraction. This was getting diluted in the space, and the doorway was what? Closing. That's one entire muscle. That's what it takes for every twitch that you have. It takes every part of that story happening for every twitch that you make. For you to write one sentence, it took that story happening dozens of times for your skeletal muscles to work. What would happen if a motor neuron got cut? The story ended before it began. This is why we can have paralysis. If we have nerves cut to our skeletal muscle, what will, we have, what will be over? The story is over. There's no, not going to be any movement, is there? If we have receptors that are no longer recognizing the neurotransmitter, is there going to be any muscle contraction? No, that's not what I'm going to tell you about. If your sodium and potassium are not in balance, remember we had more, I had to all learn. Sodium is the predominant extracellular cation, didn't I? Potassium's the predominant intracellular. But if we didn't have the right balance, would the sodium and potassium, would they be able to cross like this, causing an action potential? They wouldn't be able to, would they? So action potentials are really just electrical shocks in a cell that will get the cell to do what it's supposed to do. It doesn't just happen on muscles. Sodium and potassium have to be in the right balance for cells to have action potentials. When the cells are typically keeping sodium out and potassium in, there is a voltage current on our cells. It's called life. <laughs> our cells are alive. There's a voltage that's a measurable current on all of our cells. That's the resting potential. But when a doorway opens and sodium will pour in because there's so much of it outside and potassium pours out in response, that causes a shock which we call an action potential, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so, so every, every one of those steps that you see once one thing caused the next thing, caused the next thing, did, did you see that? Mm -hmm. And so that's why they say the story, just we learn by storytelling, do y'all know that? We learn by storytelling, we don't learn by memorizing Y'all can memorize these steps. They're in your book. They're in your textbook as numbered steps. Bless your hearts if you're still trying to memorize. Don't memorize. Make them make sense to you. Oh, that happened, which is going to cause this next thing to happen, which is going to cause this next thing to happen, and I get it. I get why the next thing would happen, right? All right, so before... You can pick up your pencils. Before I start the story, I want to tell you now about some things before I give the list of the sets. And I want you to, to have these in your pen. For skeletal muscle, for skeletal and muscle, y'all think about muscle. How many of you eat steak? It's muscle, right? So think about cutting a steak and then the potions. Okay, so it's muscle, isn't it? That's exactly what it is. Muscle is made of predominantly four proteins. It's almost all protein muscle really is. Two of them are called contractile proteins because, and I want y'all to know, the two contractile proteins are actin and myosin. And they're interwoven like this at rest. Just like this, they're interwoven. Now at rest, there's no cross bridges forming and there's no pulling them together, right? It's actin and myosin. But I had hit it to you guys in the story that calcium interacted on something on active didn't it? Let me tell you what muscles also have. They have two regulatory proteins that are regulating the contractions. And let me tell you what those two proteins are called. Those proteins are called troponin. Troponin. This is all in your notes, you know, whatever. And tropomyosin. Troponin and tropomyosin. By the way, this story won't be on your lecture quiz Thursday, but it will be 
you will have to know this really well because this is going to end up being like a lecture quiz, the story, but not the Thursday, okay? But so get it down now here. Yeah. All right, so what are the four proteins called? Actin, myosin, they're, they're the ones that do the contracting, pull the whole muscle fiber contracting. And then what were the other two? Troponin and tropomyosin, right? All right, so I want you all to picture this, picture this for me, with me for a second. On actin, which is called a thin filament, and myosin is a thick. On actin, there's two sites that are binding sites. The troponin and tropomyosin are locking them so that during rest, they're not open at all. But guess what acts on troponin and tropomyosin to unlock? Calcium. Calcium. Are you with me now? All right, so let's start the story. So that's all I really need to tell you, and I can tell you the story. You ready? The first thing you have to have is a functioning motor neuron. Any question about what tissue type of motor neuron is? What tissue type is it? It's the nervous tissue, and it? A motor neuron. Y'all, because we're about to be talking now about this, the muscle's uh, organ system, the muscular system. It's an organ system. And organs are composed of two or more what? It's tissue. tissue types. And that now I'm telling you, the first one you have to think about is nerve. So a motor neuron releases a molecule called a neurotransmitter. I want you all to put in parentheses beside that neurotransmitter, A-C-H. You can look up later, don't write this in your notes now, but you can look up later. That neurotransmitter for skeletal muscle that's relief that will tell a skeletal muscle to act, that neurotransmitter that came from the neuron is called acetylcholine. And some of y'all might have heard of acetylcholine already, but, but just you abbreviating it how? It's ACH. ACH. And it's a neurotransmitter, which simply means it's a molecule that was released from aware. That's going to transmit a what? A signal to a what? A muscle. Does that make sense? When that motor neuron released that transmitter, I told you all it had to cross a space, didn't it? It did cross a space. That space is called a synapse. A synapse. In this particular case, and don't write this down, but this makes perfect sense. This particular type of synapse is called a neuromuscular synapse. Why do you think it's called that? Because it's between a what? Neuron and a what? A muscle. Beautiful. There's no such thing as big words. They're just, they help us, these words. We know that this is a space. If any of y'all tell me that a synapse secretes something, I'm going to tell you how does space secrete anything. It doesn't, does it? What is secreting the neurotransmitter? The motor neuron. The motor neuron secretes the neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter has to cross the what? Which is a space. space. Now, you know what? That motor neuron might be releasing acetylcholine all day long. But if there isn't a what on the a receptor protein, if there isn't a receptor protein that recognizes it on the muscle, is there going to be anything happening? So that ACH has to meet with a special protein receptor on the muscle membrane. What's going to happen when it meets there? That receptor is going to do what? Open. It's going to open up. Just like the neurotransmitter was a key and a lock. Exactly like it was a key and a lock. And what can open if you get the right key and a lock? Doorway. So now you've got this doorway open, and you all know about diffusion. 
you know that if there's a lot of something in one area and not a lot in another area, and there's nothing impeding it from moving, it's going to move down its gradient, isn't it? What did y'all tell me is going to rush into the cell? And sodium's got a positive charge. It's a cation. So is potassium that has a positive charge going to say welcome? Or what is potassium going to do? Be what? It's going to be repelled, isn't it? And when they meet at the doorway, what is that going to do to the membrane? Shock it. A millivolt exchange is going to happen. It's going to shock the membrane. Is that shock just going to happen right there, or is it going to move through the fiber? It's going to move through the muscle fiber. When that shock gets to the reticulum, what is being stored in a, in a skeletal muscle reticulum? Calcium. So is it going to release the calcium into the cell, into the fiber? Into the fiber? Yes. And calcium is going to act on which of the proteins? It's going to act on the troponin tropomyosin, which are found on active. Uh, it's going to be act on troponin tropomycin, unlocking the binding sites. Unlocking the binding sites. Are you with me? I'll go through it. So calcium is going to act on troponin tropomycin, unlocking those binding sites. Now what can bind together? Actin and what? They can form these binding things. And what's happening to the entire muscle when they're binding? It's pulling together. That's known as the sliding filament theory. But you don't really have to know that. I don't care. I don't think you'll ever hear that. But that's what that's called. <coughs> but immediately what starts breaking? The binding sites. ATP breaks the binding sites. And what starts to migrate back to the reticulum? Calcium starts going back to the reticulum. And what's being diluted in the synapse? No, ACH is being diluted in the synapse. There's even an enzyme that's breaking the ACH down called acetylcholinesterase. Whatever. So, anyway, but it's an enzyme that's breaking it down. And what's happening to the doorway? It's closing back. And that's the relaxation period. For a muscle to function the way that it should, there must that relaxation period is, is as important as the excitement period where it contracts. It's as important to be happening. There's some poisons and drugs that interfere with the relaxation. So guess what you end up doing? <laughs> yes, yes, that's exactly right. Sustained muscle contraction. Which, if it hits your larynx, which are just a series of muscles your larynx are, what are you not going to be able to do? Breathe. This will close your airway. Right? All right, so we're going to talk about all that later. But, but first, we have to get what happens normally. So, just what happens normally. I'm going to go through it a little faster. If y'all want to see if you have it written down, and, or just see it in your mind, you can think this makes sense the way this has to happen. A functioning motor neuron must release a neurotransmitter that has, is able to cross a space called the synapse that acts on a very specific protein receptor that recognizes it uh, and it opens up in response to it, allowing sodium to come in, which is going to force potassium out, causing a shock at the membrane. That shock is going to move through the fiber, causing calcium to be released from the reticulum. Calcium will act on troponin and tropomyosin, unlocking the binding sites on actin, so that now actin and myosin will form binding uh, relationships which contract the, contract the entire fiber. Now the relaxation period has to happen. That's going to take ATP, breaking the binding sites, <coughs> calcium, moving back into the reticulum, 
acetylcholine, the neurotransmitter, that are being diluted in the synapse. It eats even being broken down by special en enzymes to break it down, and the receptor doorways closing. That's all part of the relaxation. Each, that entire, every one of those steps happen for every muscle twitch you have, skeletal muscle thing that you have. Every one of those steps happen. I think that's pretty amazing. Do you all? Okay. Okay. If you all have ever heard of rigor mortis, have you ever heard of rigor mortis? What does that mean? Rigor means what? Stiffness, muscle contraction. And mortis means what? Death, at death. So you all know that every living thing that dies, that dies will go through a period of rigor. Um, and it, it usually happens a specified period of time after that, depending on the environment, you know, whether it's cold or hot or, you know, kind of like, but, but also a, a special period of time. And you'll just stay in rigor for a period of time and then it eventually eases. Do you know what causes the rigor? Y'all well, all know that, that things that die go through a period of rigor, right? Rigor more. <laughs> uh, what causes that is this, a muscle fiber the, the, the person dies, or the animal dies. So is the animal producing any ATP when they die? Mm -hmm. No, there's no ATP being formed. But what's happening in the muscle fibers, and it takes a while before it happens. This is why it doesn't happen immediately. But after so many hours, depending on the environment, the reticulum is a much thinner membrane than the cell membrane. The reticulum starts to break down. And when the reticulum and your muscle fibers start to break down, what's being released in the cell? <coughs> calcium. Calcium doesn't know you're dead. It's not alive, you know. And troponin and tropomycin don't either. Calcium will still act on troponin and tropomycin. Troponin and tropomycin will move away from the binding sites on actin. And actin and mycin will form cross bridges. But what can't break them? Because you're not making them. Because you're dead. Right? Mm -hmm. And eventually, just eventually the cross bridges will break, just in nature they'll break. And so you've gone through rigor at that point. You Is that why you saying? turn cold? Well, you turn cold because you're not producing any heat. Our, chem our, our cells have chemistry happening. Mm -hmm. We have molecules being made, molecules being broken down, molecules being rearranged, and all that gets off heat. But when you're not producing any, when you're not doing any of that chemistry, you, you, yeah, so you're not producing any. So does that make sense about rigor mortis? And everything goes through rigor. And so this is why they can figure out sometimes if they, they test the ambient air, or whatever, and they figure out, okay, rigor would have probably happened this, this amount of time after death, and it would have taken this long for the person to go through it and be done with it is why they can sort of estimate when the time of death was. So those steps, those steps are every single one of them have to happen. If there's anything that interferes with any of them, then it's gonna interfere with talking skeletal muscle contraction. Are you good? Okay. So not for Thursday, but Hopefully you've got the story that you kind of got at least the outline of the story. And we'll we'll go over it quickly again on Thursday. But this is something that you all will have to know. If you know this well for the story well and the steps and if it makes sense to you, you will be able to answer quite a few questions on the next step on this on the test on the muscle. Okay. All right. So most of uh, most of that chapter, that muscle physiology chapter, most of that chapter is actually that story. I mean, that's the, hard, that's the most difficult thing about that entire chapter is that you know that story. So I will definitely finish that on this Thursday and probably Matt, I might even get to start the nervous system. But are you guys, um, are you guys <coughs> in time with the bones and muscles, especially, you know, especially since this is coming up here. And the joints and movements. So I'll get the bones out. Uh, you all need to take each, I'm gonna get the bones out so everybody can do the same time.
Y'all can take lunch, you can come back in here. This room should be available to you for quite a while. If not, we can move in into the other one. But you all will have plenty of time this afternoon, and you have until two plus two, two plus plus designated for this class. So, you know, I could hold, I could hold Ashley's hand and say, Ashley, say this afternoon. You know, say, Ashley, what is this phone? You know, I could, I could, I could, I could, I could, I could, I mean, I could be doing that, but I, I, I we're adults, so you just got to spend the time with it. But I do want to let you know about how it's going to be set up. Almost every one of these tables will be used. I will have the bones out. They will have their two colored labels, right? There will be numbers. You will be, I will give you what you need to write on. And a few people can come through at a time to be doing this, right? Because I'll be in your factory again. And if somebody's at this station, are, are you going to go up to them? No. So you're giving people plenty of space, and you can go to things several times. Um, it usually doesn't take people too long to go through through this lab. Believe it or not. Do you have any questions for me about how it's going to be presented? Just go. Okay. Let me say this to you guys. The muscles are not going to be like that. Whereas this, this is critical. This is not. I was going to say, I, I, I don't have a look at that. No. Um, your muscles laugh. I'm going to give you more of that. Are you going to have a word bank for bones? No. 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 I'm going to give you a word bank for the muscles. But I'm going to show you that how these muscles are going to be. The muscles laugh. You think, I, you think I would give you cadavers for muscles? Pictures of cadavers? No. No, because we don't have that kind of time for you to, to be able to. Cadavers not great unless they're um, new, recent cadavers. I lost the place. Sorry, guys. But what I'm going to do for the muscles lab is different. You're going to have to work that. By looking. And for the muscles lab, you're going to have these illustrated pictures that are colored. And you're going to have a lot of different views. So you'll have like posterior dorsal, the uh, posterior torso and anterior. You'll have head and neck. You know, you'll have limbs. So you have a lot of pictures. And so you'll be labeling those. Does that make sense? And you'll have very specific directions and how to do it. But that's how the muscle lab is. I we don't have enough time here, and y'all don't have enough time um, for me to sit pins and cats or muscles or or even cadavers. It wouldn't even be fair to do that with cadavers, but I think these illustrations are definitely there for y'all and how much you have time to do. So okay, I'll get to the last time. And those, my people for the histology, when do y'all want to start the histology? Sooner than later or a break? Sooner than later, everybody say that? Okay. Let me get the phone down and we'll do it. <laughs> These have become your friends, haven't they? Admit it. Um, you guys, I just brought this out just because I just saw it in there. This, this obviously 
<laughs> this, this obviously is here, so this is the auditory canal, and this would be the membrane. Now, I'm not going to put this out for your bone. I'm not going to put this out for your bone thing. But this is the malleus, the incus, and the sapiens. But these are obviously enlarged for you to see. Your malleus, incus, and sapiens could fit on a dime. There's three tiny little bones that, that uh, articulate with each other. I just thought I'd get it out because I saw it sitting there. Um, and if somebody would like to figure out how to put it in here that it would stay, that would be awesome. I don't think it really will. I think it just sits. Okay. All right. Um, there's the three of you guys. I'm going to... Um, I'm gonna, we're going to be over here, so all y'all need is a pencil. But if you are y'all looking over your things right now, are you looking over them? It, it will take me just a second, but if you wanted to come over, you could. While I'm getting set up. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Is it the right or the left? Yeah, or was it like left and right? I don't know what it is. The posterior is the right. Okay, the posterior is from the outside. Of the fibula. What's facing me is the front. Right. The front is. Let's see, this is the anterior view. Right. It's the wrong side on that one. So I guess it's just this is the left one. Yeah. So you're not going to have a right and left in every set of bones. So we noticed that from the last time she had it out was that they some of them were exactly the same, and there were none of like you know, two left and no right or things like that. So out of this set, I wouldn't try to like match up a left and a right. Exactly. <laughs> Okay. 
Oh, I, I just make Thank you. 
going to be humorous. Humorous hair. And that's just right here. When you do see uh, CPR, you have to be that voice. You don't want to put your voice right here. Like this. 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 Like but you all have to be here. Oh, gosh. Right now. Well, maybe it's just behind. I know behind the They talk to me. I'm going to throw my hands. I'm going to roll up. I'm going to say, roll up. Yeah. Let's be careful because that can. I know it just breaks that great box into a little bit. Something is there. You know, I'm mad eventually. Don't worry. So you know that the research only so you're not supposed to hit anyone in the back of the back because what happens is it lodges further down. You're supposed to stick your finger in and sweep out. Well, well, if you think about it, you're gonna. That's the they say there's a lot of people who don't. So and they go right in, so kind of over to the side to sweep. We went to graduation a year ago, and I was wondering what Well, so he got a I like to see our and the I don't know. 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 I don't
Oh, it's so sick and awesome. It was like, I just <laughs> Chill out. And I'm thumping her. So I'm like, ready? And he goes, and I was like, ugh. <laughs> but this is literally going up. I'm like, I'm going to her up there. I'm like, all right, get back to the city. It's so awesome. You can probably leave her ever. Hey guys, guess what?